Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Paolo Bonzini. I'm a distinguished engineer at Red Hat, and I would like to present QMU status support for 2020. Let's start looking at the previous here at Lights. We had deprecated Python to support, introduced kconfig, developed faster boot, and started using Sphinx for documentation. This slide comes from the last year status report, and I would like to report further progress, especially on the first and the last bullets. The big change with respect to Python support is that we only support Python 3 and we follow the Python lifecycle. So we do not support any more Python releases that have been declared end of life by the CPython developers. We also completed the switch to Sphinx and I will talk more about the benefits that this brought later. Among the other highlights of 2020, I want to point out new targets and boards because these had existed for a long time as forks of QMU and they were now merged upstream. Another new feature is the Virtaio file system daemon, which was already presented last year but is now merged. And finally, the improved CI and Mason build systems are both very important for QMU developers. With respect to CI, GitLab is now the main CI system that we rely upon. It also takes care of building containers for developers to reproduce CI issues on their machines and for other CI systems such as Shippable. However, Shippable is being phased out in favor of GitLab itself. We still use Travis to test a wide variety of build configurations and to cover native builds on non x86 architectures. Like OS builds have moved to Cirrus CI and now Cirrus CI covers Windows builds as well. We also use it for FreeBSD, as has been the case for a long time. Another new addition is the OSS Files project uh, that relies on the phasing support that was also merged uh, in the beginning of this year. And finally, we are now running Coverity daily rather than weekly as before. For the future, we plan to limit further use of Travis, and uh, we would also like to add non-x86 runners for GitLab that are specific to QMU. This uh, would let us integrate Patchu with GitLab CI and make sure that every contributor uh, will be able to use those runners. We also have some configurations that are not yet covered by CI and they are only tested by Peter Maidel before applying pull requests. This set should shrink further and further until ultimately the CI can be used as the gate for maintaining pull requests. Now, let's talk a bit about technical depth how QMU suffered from it, and what we did about it in 2020. One common aspect of technical debt is that often it appears in areas that grow by accretion, and without a solid design foundation that supports that growth, typically there's also limited documentation and few people knowing their intimate details. If those areas then are modified by many people, the changes will not be reviewed accurately despite the best intention of the developers. And that's how technical depth emerges. Often we also speak of technical depth for areas where the tools we use are obsolete and have limited interoperability with the rest of the world. For example, this was the case for documentation. And documentation together with QM and the build system was one area where QMU suffered from technical depth. QMU was using uh, Techinfo as a source format for documentation. Techinfo is a perfectly fine format, but it's hard to extend because it's even hard to just find a good parser for the info besides the make info tool. Therefore, it was hard to integrate the documentation build with any other tool than the shell and make. For example, we have had documentation comments in the code for almost 10 years now, but they were basically unused because the developer documentation was just a bunch of files. It wasn't properly bundled into a manual. Also, the only time where we built and uploaded the manuals was at release time. By using Sphinx, we were able to extend the process with Python code, basically creating entire parts of the documentation programmatically. We reused the kernel doc script from Linux to include documentation from the source code in the developer manual. And we used Pandoc to convert by existing tech info sources to restructured text. We also have now continuous deployment of the manual as a result, and you can find the latest QMU manual at any given time on qmu.readthedocs.io. The next area that I'd like to touch is QRM. The main problem with QRM probably was that it wasn't even clear to most people why QRM existed. 
When QAM was introduced, it was presented as a consistent object model aiming to unify the configuration of devices and backends. But this doesn't really answer the question of why QAM looks like it does to the programmer. It doesn't explain the principles of QAM to developers. We have made some progress in that area. First of all, the QAM documentation is more accessible now that we have a proper developer manual. But also, through mailing list discussions, we got to a definition of QAM's design that looks like this. QAM's stamp system is about objects and their properties, and it lets objects expose properties to multiple channels. These channels include QMP, the command line, and the human monitor. There is a lot of work to do on QAM, for example, with respect to introspection. For now, what we did was improving the documentation, reducing the boilerplate that is needed to implement QAM classes, and also making the QDev APIs more similar to the rest of QAM. QDEV was the pre-existing object model that was used for devices. And while it is now based on QM, a lot of its APIs had retained the original flavor. By making these APIs more similar to the rest of QM, we hope to make it easier for new developers to learn QDEV and QOM. And finally, the Maison build system. I will stand for a little bit on a softbox and talk a bit about it, because it's a very large change. I don't know who said this, but I picture two friends at the bar, which is a rare occurrence this day, of course. One of them is a little bit tipsy and says to the other, you know, the problem with programmers is that when they have a problem, they start to program. And this is true, and that's how you end up with this kind of code in your build system. And also this code. Now, I must say that this beauty was also very well documented. Probably it had more lines of comments than lines of code, but that didn't make it any easier to debug. So, even though we cannot guarantee that the build system will be simple, maybe we should make sure that people need to debug the build system as little as possible. What does it mean to keep the build system logic as simple as possible? The choice for QMU's new build system was that each file should only be read once. So you first gather the data, you process it, and then move on to the next phase, which operates in the same way. In the old build system, reading the same file uh, multiple times, for example, all the make files, made it slow, but also caused namespace collisions and ordering issues that were hard to debug. The problem with doing this kind of surgery to a project as large as QMU is that it's not really possible to convert everything at once. For QMU 5.2, we have established the foundation and the beginning of the development phase, and then converted much of the low-hanging fruit. Everything else can be done in due time, and throughout the process, we'll make sure to work with Maison upstream. Whenever there is something that can be improved in Maison, we have noted it already, and we have explained any workarounds that were needed. In fact, going from makefiles to Maison was a very large change, not only in terms of the sheer amount of code changes, but also in terms of paradigm and trade-offs. Shell and makefile, for example, are very flexible, but they are rather low level, and they only support strings as the data types. On the other hand, Maison has high-level constructs and data types, but it operates at the level of a command as an array of strings, rather than at the level of the shell pipeline. Another difference is that make is a declarative system, and the macros we had on top were not really declarative, but they tried to fake being declarative. The Maison DSL instead is more uh, of the imperative kind, Though it lacks aliasing uh, and mostly has unmutable uh, objects, and that mitigates the difference, it also makes it harder to misuse Maison. Number of lines of code is not really different because one of the scripts we used uh, to ease the transition is actually pretty large. The script uh, called Ninja Tool will hopefully disappear already before the next release, and once you discount it, the new build system is already about a thousand lines or 10% smaller. Most of the reduction comes from the configure script, but the make file cells will also become much smaller. And especially all of the complicated logic from those slides is gone. Recursive make is also gone, the build is entirely non-recursive, and the remaining make file logic is manageable since it's only about 400 lines of code. Finally, here is the fun part. I decided not to include the traditional count of commit and reviews, but rather do a little who's who game and starting with uh, our interns for Google Summer of Code. We also participated in outreach, but unfortunately we didn't get an intern from that program. In Summer of Code, however, we got three. And not only did all three students pass, 
Also, their code has already been merged. Cesar contributed emulation for U2F security keys. Philip worked on Linux user, and Ahmed established a framework for continuous benchmarking of TCG performance. Moving on, here are a few shout outs to some members of the community. In many cases, their work has been mentioned already earlier in the presentation. For example, Thomas and Alex uh, did a lot of work on CI. The QM QDEV refactoring was completed thanks to Marcus and Brewster, Daniel Branche, and Eduardo Habkost. And Eduardo also worked on documentation together with Peter Medel. Also, Richard Henderson kept on doing great work on TCG and on a lot of other parts of QMU. And also, I would like to thank Laurent and Philippe for keeping alive the hobbyist origins of QMU, so to speak. And of course, to Peter for merging everything and ensuring that QMU development runs smoothly. So, what's next for 2021? It's quite likely that we will use GitLab more. Here, I listed five features that QMU could use from GitLab. Probably we won't use all of them, but still, here are some ideas. Generating and deploying QMU's static site, QMU.org, could be done through a GitLab pipeline, for example. And perhaps even the primary repository for QMU could be hosted on GitLab instead of relying on the QMU project's own servers. Release tables could also be prepared during GitLab CI, which we don't currently do. And this would make the process of cutting a release more automatic. GitLab also provides issue tracking and the wiki. Currently, we use respectively Launchpad and MediaWiki, but immigration here is more complex because, of course, we would have to move existing data. A hot topic is going to be rethinking the QM API. We had a huge mailing list thread between last December and last February, and one idea that surfaced was to simplify the relation between QMU and management tools by making the configuration of the VM more homogeneous. For example, right now we have substantial differences between how to configure uh, the VM initially and how to later hot plug uh, additional hardware or backends. This means we would have to look at all of QMU's 131 command line options and decide for which we would need to provide an alternative means to do the same configuration, for example, through QAPI, possibly QMP since management tools already have to deal with it. And another thing that would uh, help management would be to provide official bindings for the management tools to QAPI. This should cover multiple languages, of which the most important probably are Go and Python, in order to let people focus on working with QMU and not reinvent the QAPI wheel. Finally, for security, we would like to be able to isolate security-sensitive parts of QMU to multiple processes. For now, we have the host user servers supported in QMU storage daemon, but an extension to this idea is to use different languages, not just different processes, including, of course, Rust. For this reason, Mark and Relo has looked at QAPI bindings for Rust. Not so much for consuming QAPI as was the case uh, for the previous slide, but for exposing Rust language constructs through QAPI, roughly the same as we do in C already. So that's it for this year's QMU status report. Thanks and enjoy the rest of KVM Forum.